Today's scripture reading is found in is Psalm 41, 4 through 10. You'll find it on page 514 of the Bible in your pew. But I'll read it for you. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? And when one comes to see me, he utters empty words while his heart gathers iniquity. When he goes out, he tells it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They say a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. What I love about the Psalms is how very human they are. They capture a wide range of human experiences and human emotions. In fact, when Pastor Neil asked me to preach on the Psalms, I set out to find a Psalms that didn't have anything like, raise me up that I may repay them. I looked and looked and looked and looked and looked, and I couldn't find one. Somewhere in every Psalms, at some point, somebody gets angry and asks for revenge. But that's the beauty of the Psalms, that it really does reflect everything that we feel and experience. This particular Psalm captures the human experience of being betrayed, and our desire for revenge when that occurs. We can all imagine being the writer, and we've all been the one who he's writing about at some time, at some point in our lives. Hopefully, we don't experience these things all at once. But if we look back on the Psalms, what it's saying is there are people who are asking themselves, when is this guy going to die? I never want to hear his name again. They're being two-faced. They're saying one thing, in front of him, and another thing behind his back. They're wishing the worst for him, and maybe wishing he would even die and never come back. They would even break bread with him and turn against him, betray him. We all at one point or another have felt the way the psalmist feels. We have all felt what it's like to maybe disappoint other people, have them turn against us, have them say negative things about us, not be able to do anything about it, just have to suffer the slings and arrows. And we all have this feeling that, God, be gracious to me and raise me up so that I can repay them. This will seem like a non sequitur, but... Bear with me. So with COVID, um, I graduated in 1998 with my PhD. There were 12 other people. I don't know if there were 12 other people who graduated with me. And since COVID, we've been gathering every month or so on Zoom and just, just catching up and talking to one another, which is nice. Two of them are my close friends. We talk quite frequently. But the others I, I haven't seen or known about for quite some time. And so it's good to get to know them again and in a different, different way as well. In our last conversation, the thought experiment came up that um, if you were going to have dinner you know, and you could invite any three people you wanted to invite, who would you invite? And I ask you to think about that yourself. Who is it that you would invite to dinner? For me, it was Jesus Christ, of course. I'm sure that's an answer for all of you as well. Bono, because I'm a lifelong YouTube fan. And then Sigmund Freud, but then I sort of realized Sigmund was just ruined the conversation, really. So I thought, well, my, my mother, my mother, I would like to know, uh, visit with my mother again and see how she's doing. And as I listened to everybody else's answers, uh, what I realized is it, it's pretty much captured by it's either a celebrity, some historical figure, or someone, someone you're close to and who passed away that you want to have back with you. 
And, and again, I ask you to reflect, who is that, who are those people for you? And in a way, what's important about the question in the context of today's sermon is not who you invited. I'd be interested to find out, but that's not the key question. Really, what I want to ask you is who you didn't invite. Who is it that you didn't invite? And I bet you it's not the person that will gladly take your job when you step down. It's not somebody who's really close to you who when you make a mistake will distance themselves from you. It's not the person who will let you down when you need it the most. It's not the person who doubts your greatest accomplishment. It's not the person who would write this song. You didn't think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask my worst enemy to come to this dinner. It's time that we had a talk, right? Let's clear the air. That's not who you invited. I bet you if I gave you 12 people to invite, none of these people would occur to you. Above all, it's not the person who's going to betray you. But that's exactly who Jesus invited to the Last Supper. John tells us in 13.1 that he loved them to the end. And before dinner... Jesus wipes the disciples' feet. He cleans their feet. And then he says to them, the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. That reflects the scripture that's being fulfilled in the words of Jesus here are Psalm 41.9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. And John goes on to tell us that after saying this, he who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another uncertain of whom he spoke. Mark tells us that they began to be sorrowful and say to him, one after another, is it me? Is it I? Could it be me? Could I do that? Is that who it is? Now, what does that tell us? What does that tell us? They all thought the most likely suspect for betraying Jesus was themselves. Nobody pointed at anybody else. Judas did not stand out like a sore thumb. Nobody, nobody thought Judas. It's definitely Judas. I've been suspicious of that guy since the beginning. My kids would say he's sus, right? He's suspicious, right? But nobody did that. Nobody pointed the finger at anybody else. Judas didn't stand out any more than anybody else. Everyone reflected on their own selves and what they were capable of. And they doubted themselves. They wondered, could I do this? Am I the person who will do this? Even after Jesus says, it is he whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas the son of Iscariot. Now, the other disciples didn't dogpile on Judas at that point. Jesus, Jesus has given a clear indication that he's going to be betrayed, that it's this person that is going to betray me. In fact, in disappointment, Jesus says, after giving Judas this one last opportunity to redeem himself, Jesus says, go, go on your way. Do what you're going to do. Do it quickly. And so here we have Judas, like abruptly leaving the dinner. The dinner hasn't started. They just clean their feet, sitting down to dinner. Jesus makes this statement, and Judas departs. That doesn't even stand out to the disciples. The disciples don't get suspicious then either. They think, oh, he's going to pay for dinner, or he's going to give alms to the poor. He's the accountant after all. 
but they make excuses. They, they, they don't assume that it's him, even after being pointed out that this is the guy. This is it. This is it. And so it sort of begs the question, did Judas take the first communion at the Last Supper? What John says is, so after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. And so it sort of suggests that, no, he didn't. He probably didn't. Luke suggests, Mark suggests that he probably does as well. Matthew is ambiguous. For a long while, I went down this rabbit hole of did Judas take communion or not? And it's like a lot of other things. One gospel says yes, another gospel says no, another gospel doesn't speak to it. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of discovery to be found there and to be made. But what I realized is that's not the right question. That's a red herring. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Judas gave, Jesus gave Judas every opportunity to change his mind, to change his heart, and not do what really he had to do anyway. Judas sealed his own fate. That is not what's important. Whether Judas ate communion or not is not what's important. What stands out here is that Jesus offered Judas communion. He invited Judas to the table. Even Judas was invited to the table. Now, we hold a special place for Judas. I'm going to ask, I'm going to bet that if I ask you who's your favorite, you're not going to say Judas. And in fact, most of the times that Judas's name is mentioned in the Bible, he's always mentioned like always made clear Judas of Iscariot who betrayed Jesus, right? So he stands out from the beginning. I'm sure none of you would select him as your favorite disciple. But really, the others are just as disappointing. Jesus tells Peter after the dinner, he says, truly, truly, I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter says to Jesus what any of us would say to Jesus. Even if I must die with you, I would never deny you. And all the disciples agreed. They said the same thing. And I'm sure they all meant it. I'm sure Peter had every intention of being sure that he would not deny Christ. And yet he did. After Jesus was arrested, the guards come up to him. They ask him about Jesus. Jesus, I don't know who Jesus is. Jesus, who's this Jesus you're talking about? Never heard of him? Don't know, don't know anything about him. Sure enough, Peter denies him. Thomas doubts him. Even when re Christ returns after the resurrection, wounded, Thomas doubts him. John says, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Even given objective evidence of Jesus Christ's resurrection, Thomas doesn't believe him. He's been told all the way up to that day, I'm coming back. And yet he can't believe it until he touches it. Before the dinner, we're told that all of the disciples were having a dispute. Luke says, a dispute almost also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Before they sit down for this dinner, they're talking about who's going to take Jesus's place. It's like, oh, there, that's a pretty cool job. I like that. He, the people really like him, right? I want his job. There's 12 of us. Who's going to take his job when he's done? Are those the people that you want at dinner? Probably not. Jesus, after he leaves the dinner, goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And he takes his disciples with him. And he says, sit here while I pray. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And he goes and he prays to the Father, and he returns. And when he came back, he found them sleeping. He says, what are you doing sleeping? Could you not watch for one hour? So he goes and he prays to his Father. He says, stay awake, guard me. Something terrible is going to happen to me tonight. 
I need you to stay awake so that we know when this goes away, he comes back. Sure enough, they're asleep. You're still sleeping? You're taking a rest? I'm telling you, something serious is going to happen tonight. I need you to stay up. Will you please stay up? He goes and he prays and he comes back a third time. And now you know what he's going to find. He's going to find them sleeping. He says, the spirit is willing, but the body isn't able. And so all in all, the disciples are a pretty sorry bunch. They all fall short of what we would even want for ourselves because they're human, because they're human. They do these things. They were all guilty in one way or another. John tells us before describing the feast of the Passover, which becomes the Lord's Supper, he says, Jesus loved them when they were in the world and he loved them until the end of the world. He loved them to the end. And so my question today becomes, who is worthy of receiving communion? Who is it that Jesus is inviting to the table? I have some good news and some bad news. I think the answer is no one and everyone. explain. Paul in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is and it takes place after Acts, which I talked about in my last sermon, which is after the return of Christ, where he gives the great commandment to go out, make disciples, baptize the heathen. And in Acts, that's what they're beginning to do. And lots of people are converting to Christianity. Well, in Corinthians, Paul writes letters to various churches. Well, to, in this case, he writes several letters to different churches, but in this case, he's writing to the Corinthians, and he's sort of scolding them about things they're doing and things they're not doing and the way they're doing it and whatnot. And, and in one of the passages, chapter 11, he tells us what it means to receive the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. First, he tells us, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks in judgment of himself. And he tells us, how is it that you're to do it in a worthy manner? What does it mean to receive communion in a worthy manner? He says, let each person examine themselves then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So how do we receive the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner? First, examine yourself. First and foremost, examine yourself, not other people. That's not what this is about. Like the disciples, the way in which the disciples turn to themselves first and ask, am I capable of that? Would I do that? In addition, be grateful. Be grateful that the Lord receives everyone to his table. Those who denied him, those who doubted him, those who failed him, those who envied him. He loved them until the end. And so examine yourselves not others, be grateful, and be welcoming like Christ. I'll close with a reflection from the Book of Order, which tells us the opportunity to eat and drink with Christ is not a right bestowed upon the worthy, but a privilege given to the undeserving who come in faith, repentance, and love. Worshippers prepare themselves to celebrate the Lord's Supper by putting their trust in Christ, confessing their sins, and seeking reconciliation with God and one another. 
And so today we will receive the communion, and I hope that you will do it in a worthy manner as Paul describes to us and as Jesus shows us.